Welcome to Fast Track. Over the next eight weeks, we're gonna cover from Genesis to Revelation. Each week we'll begin here with some unique teaching methods and an introduction to the day's theme. Then we'll move on to the core teaching of Genesis through Revelation. And I'll come back at the end and show you how the entire Bible points to Jesus. The Bible tells us that the basic challenge of the human heart is not believing that God exists, but believing He is good. Can we really trust God with our lives, with our decisions? You see, when we struggle with worry, we worry about things like, how am I going to do on that test? Or what about my finances? Or what about the future? I talked to a guy recently who found himself obsessed with worry, constantly checking his, his 401k and his 403b and where's his finances. And he said he was overwhelmed with worry. I said, do you really believe God is good? Because if you believe God is good, you can put yourself under his care and his concern. But he was struggling with the thing the Bible says we all struggle with. Can we trust that God is good? Especially when we face the unknown. We get cut from the team. That's a breakup. We go through a difficult time in our marriage. We face empty nest. We don't get into that college that we, we dreamed of. It's in those times we wonder, is God really good? Is God really reliable? That's the theme today. Is God reliable and is God good? One of the biggest challenges is trusting God during times of suffering. But the introduction to the book of Genesis, God is trying to show us that He is good and He is reliable and we can trust Him with whatever we're struggling with. If we're struggling with bitterness or unforgiveness, it's because we don't trust that God's reliable as a judge. If we struggle with worry, it's because we don't trust that God's really in control. But in the opening book of Genesis, God says, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. And into the heavens and earth, God is going to speak. And over and over again, it will say, and he spoke. And his power and his majesty and his artistry and his goodness was displayed for all to see. Well, I love science. You know, God reveals himself as one who shows his invisible attributes through both general revelation, science and nature, and specific revelation, the Bible itself. Imagine that this is the heavens. And God creates the heavens, the raw materials, and, and God creates the earth and its raw materials. But then God says, I want mankind to know that I am reliable and I am good. I want you to know that when I say something, it happens. There's power in my voice. There's goodness in my character. And no matter what happens in life, you can trust my heart. See, God's word became an activator. And as he spoke into the heavens, and the Bible says heavens because it includes the heaven where the birds fly. The second layer of heaven is where the stars and the moons and the planets are. And the third heavens is where God lives. And God speaks into the heavens. And as he speaks, he's going to form the planets, the earth, the stars, and the asteroids. And as he speaks into the earth, he's going to form the fowl, the fish, and the creeping things. So are you ready? I know I am. Here we go. God speaks into both these environments and says, I am good and I am reliable. You can trust me with everything you need in life. And all of a sudden, as they watch God's power speak into the heavens and speak into the earth, God's power began to be displayed. And Adam and Eve would hear about this God, the God who is a creator, the God who is a designer, the guy, God whose heart is for them. And God's power began to, to lift and God's heart began to show. And all of a sudden, God's power was displayed in such a way that it began to form and power was released. And all through creation, they sensed that God was available, that God was available for life. And the heavens were formed. And all the things God made were formed in seven days. As God said, what you need is here. My character is for you. You can trust me. And he was an artist. Colors and textures all flowed from the goodness of God. And God was saying to you and I, you can trust me. I am the reliable God. And if you can trust me for creation, then you can trust me with everyday life too.
she ran away to sleep Dreamed of para, para, paradise Para, para, paradise Para, para, paradise Every time she closed her eyes Welcome to Fast Track Promises. Today we are going to do an overview of the Bible for the next six weeks so we can have an overview of Jesus' Bible. And that's the books that you and I may have heard called the Old Testament. Now in doing that, we're going to begin, like that last song said, looking at creation. Where did we begin? Where did problems begin? Uh, Where did God's plan begin? But this is going to be very different from a series we did eight years ago. So if you were here eight years ago, we went through the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, called Fast Track um, just by itself. This series is called Fast Track Promises. We're going to give you an overview of the Bible. So if you've never been through the series before, at the end of the series, you're going to really understand all of the Old Testament, how it all fits together. However, you're going to come away each, each week with four promises, specific promises God has for you, whatever it is you're going through. I think for many of us, we grew up hearing about or having the, at least perception, that the Bible was filled with superheroes. You know, be like Adam and be like Noah and be like Samson. What we're going to find is something very different as we go through the Bible. These characters are not superheroes who do everything right. In fact, more often than not, even from the beginning, we find out that just about everyone in the Bible did everything wrong. The Bible is not about people who did good stuff. It's about people who did the wrong stuff and a God who works with them. 
In fact, that's the big promise. God gives us promises to keep us on track. But his greatest promise is that he works with people who are off track, people who hide and people who indulge and people who lie and people who manipulate. He works with people like you and me. In fact, we just did a Christmas picture recently after our Christmas Eve service. It's always great when you see Christmas pictures, like on Facebook or family photos. You think, wow, they look like a, a handsome family. They look like they've got it all together. They must never fight, right? <laughs> they must have the best marriage and the best kids. We all look good from a distance. But when you get up close to us, you find out that we are narrow-minded and selfish and self-centered and unkind, right? The closer you get to know each one of us, the more you discover how broken we really are. The same thing is true of the Bible. The Bible's a case study in how broken we are. In fact, uh, I recently had to go get some dental work done for my second implant, and when they did an x-ray to see what's inside me, all of a sudden you realize, wow, Chad's not only doing everything right, looks like Chad's got some serious problems. Besides, he looks like a zombie in this picture, the three-dimensional view of my jaw. It also shows, wow, he's done a lot of dental work. Doesn't look like Chad brushed and flossed very well. That's exactly right. It was kind of a case study staring at me in a 3D model and in a black and white of all my errors, all my mistakes, going back 40 years. Specifically when I had braces when I was a teenager, and they told me, brush, 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 and I'm like, oh, it's such a pain to get in between these things. Two and a half years later, I get the braces off. Oh my goodness, I had root canals galore, you know, drill-ins, I got implants now. You, You get close to me and you find out, wow, Chad's really not got it together. And my hope today is that as we examine four characters in the Bible, just four today, starting from creation all the way up through the book of Genesis, we're going to find characters we identify with who have made the same kind of mistakes we've made. And yet a God who wants to work with us in the middle of those mistakes to give us promises we can hold on to when we need it the most. So we're going to begin with our first character, Adam. God creates the world and everything in it. He creates all the animals, he creates the sky, he creates everything, and he places someone in it made in his own image, Adam and Eve. He enjoys his time with them, he interacts with them. He just says the one thing you don't wanna do is eat from that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, because when you know what evil is, it brings darkness into your life. And guess what? Adam does exactly what God told him not to do. Adam doesn't obey God, and he doesn't do what he says. In fact, the first thing we're introduced to when we see Adam is that Adam hides. So God has created this incredible garden, this incredible place of paradise. And he says, you can enjoy all of it. I've made it all for you. Except there's one thing that you don't want in your life, and that is the knowledge of good and evil. There's a tree with darkness in it, and if you eat that darkness, if you eat of the the, the fruit of that tree, it will bring shame and guilt and difficulty into your life. Now, they do, and that darkness affects them, affects Adam, it affects Eve, and all of a sudden, things were good, things were wonderful, no death, no pain, and now, all of a sudden, they have to hide. They are no longer living in paradise. They're living in sadness, and they hide. They hide from God. They hide from each other. Shame has come in to the picture. And unfortunately, we still experience shame today. In fact, what happens here in the passage is it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, I don't think God's right that this is going to bring bad consequences. It actually looks pretty good. And how often do we do that? Something that someone told us would be bad for us, we say, ah, I think you're holding out. So it was pleasant to the eyes. That looks really good. And a tree desirable to make one wise. Yeah, that won't cause any problems. It'll make me wise. So she took of its fruit and ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, open to evil, open to bad stuff. 
and they suddenly knew that they were naked. Shame comes into their life. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. When you have guilt and shame, you have to cover yourself, make excuses for yourself, rationalize your actions. Isn't that what we all do? We know when we're on the wrong course. We lie, we rationalize, we justify, we compartmentalize. We try and cover up what we've done. It's not a big deal. No, no, you don't understand. That's not really what happened. We hide. It continues. So they they cover themselves and Adam and, and Eve hid themselves. They hide. They hide what they've done. They hide from each other. They can't be honest anymore with each other about what they've done. And they hid specifically from God. There there was a disconnection between them and their creator. They hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. So God, the Lord God, has to call Adam and say to him, hey, hey, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat of? And the man said, this is so great, this classic hiding, blaming. The woman did it. It, It's her fault. The woman, by the way, whom you gave me. It's the woman's fault. And by the way, it's your fault, God. Isn't that what we all do? It's, it's finger pointing. Well, yeah, I might, but it's, if, I, if she hadn't, then I wouldn't have, and if you didn't, then I wouldn't. These are all clever defense mechanisms we all have to hide from the truth. And here's how it ends. The woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the tree. Well, then I just happened to, you know, ate, ate it because it was there, right? So how about you? Do you have a tendency to hide? to lie, to fudge the truth. Oh, it comes out in little ways and in big ways. I remember my wife and I were driving home from my uh, parents' house over the Thanksgiving Christmas time period, and she said, hey, Chad, uh, did you remember to get Christmas Eve tickets for us and my family when they come in town? You ever have that moment? Like your wife's driving next to you. She's just told you to do something like three times and you haven't done it. And now you have a chance to uh, come honest about it. And of course, what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what I do. I lied, I lied, 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 right? I didn't want to get in trouble. I uh, didn't want to hear a speech and didn't want her to think that I forgot to do it. So she says, hey, honey, did you get the Christmas tickets? And I turned and looked at her square in the eye and said, oh, yes, honey. That's exactly what I did. I got the Christmas tickets. Now, meanwhile, I'm driving, right? So uh, I got the left hand going. I'm texting, need Christmas tickets for such and such. <laughs> need how many? I'm emailing to the office. And my wife's like, what, what are you doing? And I came clean. I didn't really get the tickets. Really? Why'd you lie to me? Well, I didn't really want to feel like I didn't pull through. So I, I'm sorry. And It's just a tendency, right? I don't want to face the consequences that I can be irresponsible. And so it's bad enough what we do initially, but then we lie about it. We cover it. And that's why when we hide and justify and finger point, we need promises from God. I was talking to a buddy of mine who works at P&G recently. He's got younger kids. He said, Chad, I had a plumber come over. And the plumber said to me, here's the thing about kids. They're born liars. You got to teach them to tell the truth. He's like, man, that is so true. So God gives them a promise. This promise is powerful. The promise is when you know that it's covered, you can examine anything. See, if you and I know that whatever we've done, past, present, and future, is covered by God's forgiveness, and that's the main message of the Bible, that God forgives you of everything you ever did do, are doing, or will do. And that's not a license to start doing stuff wrong. The opposite. When you know everything you've done is covered by God's forgiveness, you can actually start examining why you lie, why you rationalize, why you excuse. Because you know whatever you find in the closets of your life, God's already forgiven you for it. Remember, they try to cover themselves. But in Genesis 3.15, God gives them a promise about forgiveness that everything they've done could be covered. Here's what he says. I'm gonna put enmity or, or division between you, he's talking to the source of evil, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. So one day in the future, the seed of Eve, her descendant, Jesus, is going to be bruised by you. Evil, you're gonna be able to kind of smash him, crucify him, but he's gonna ultimately overcome you and he's going to, Bruise, you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your 
head. So God says, I'm gonna find and send a final forgiver to cover everything you've done wrong. But you don't have to wait till then. He goes on in the next verse, chapter three, verse 21 and 22, and he says, I wanna make you a covering right now. Here's how he says it. So for Adam and for Eve, the Lord God made tunics of skin and he clothed them. Then the Lord said, behold, man has become like one of us, talking to the other spiritual beings, to know good and evil. So what did God do? Same thing he does for you and I. He knows we hide. He knows we finger point. He knows we rationalize. He says, I'm gonna send someone in the future to bring about ultimate forgiveness. Evil's gonna try and crush him and crucify him, but he's going to crush the head of evil. And he's gonna create a covering of forgiveness for anyone who receives it. In the meantime, I'm gonna create a covering for you now to cover your guilt and shame. Because the promise of Christianity is you don't have to live under guilt and shame. You can live in freedom even when you discover you're not as great as you think you are. So, Adam hides. And his promise, when you know it's covered, you can examine anything. Who's our second character? Our second character is Noah. And you may have heard of Noah. You may have had pictures or maybe your kids or grandkids had uh, Noah pictures in their uh, nursery. So most of us know something about Noah, and that is that he built an ark, and there was a giant flood, right? And he had incredible faith and patience to trust in God, and he took two of each kind into that ark. What you may not know is after he got off the ark, God gave him a promise, we'll talk about that in a moment, with the the rainbow, but one of the things we discover about Noah is that Noah indulges. Now, who knows why? I mean, all the stress, all the difficulty, all the things he's seen, he begins to medicate and he gets drunk. He gets so drunk, in fact, that he ends up naked before all his kids to see, and it's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to them, and it causes, as we'll see, some pretty significant problems. So Noah did some good things, no doubt, but one of the things the Bible highlights is that Noah indulges. Now, what do you mean? Well, let's look at that passage together. Here's what happens. Noah began to be a farmer. He's off the boat. He's starting his new life. God has washed clean everything that was broken. Adam and Eve had had some kids. They had rebelled. Things had gotten worse and worse and worse until everything in the whole world, the intent of every person's thoughts were evil, and God has to wash away and start over. Noah's now got off of the boat, and here's his new life. Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and got drunk. Fine to drink wine, but he indulged. He used it to fix something, to control something, to handle some inner anxiety in him. And he became uncovered in his tent. Now Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside, hey, dad's drunk and dad's naked in the tent. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, they laid it on both their shoulders, they went backwards, they covered up dad because he was in a drunken state to cover the nakedness of their father. Now their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Now, this is very complicated to figure out what his younger son had done to him. So let's start with why is he indulging? Why do any of us indulge? All right, there's a thousand reasons. The Bible's not clear. Is it PTSD from being out at the ocean for a year? Is it the stress of having seen so many people, even evil people, die before your eyes? Is it the stress of being cooped up with your family, eight of you, uh, and all your in-laws for a whole year in the same tight space? So that would drive anyone to drink, right? Is it the care and wear and tear of the animals? Is it the expectations that the whole world and all those expectations are on my back? We don't know. Cabin fever, maybe. What we do know is that the stress, the pressure, the new life, all the things that were going on in his life led him to drink and drink and drink. Enough that he got drunk enough that he's laying naked before his family in an incredible time of embarrassment. And again, maybe you don't struggle with uh, alcohol. Maybe yours is junk food. 
Maybe yours is shopping or overspending. But we all have a tendency to indulge. We take something and we use it to become more than just something. Our source of peace, our source of comfort. Now whatever is going on here leads to incredible trauma. So whatever Ham did to his father, there's a little phrase here that seems to imply that what Ham did is while he was drunk and, and, and naked, he actually went and had relations with his mother and they ended up having a child and it's an incestual relationship. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time to deal with that now except to say the consequences of this drunkenness cause incredible pain for generations to come. But if you're interested, I did cover this in detail in a message several years ago. If you go to our website, horizoncc.com, click on media downloads. If you type in how to overcome your past, I deal with sexual trauma. I deal with the pain that's caused by that and how God can bring about healing. So type into our media search, how to overcome your past. I address this in Leviticus because it's the same phrase used here in the book of Genesis, how to overcome your past from June 25th of 2017. But why do any of us indulge? Well, I think it's actually pretty simple. Whatever medication we choose, when we turn something into something that we use to keep from feeling a feeling we don't wanna feel. It's no longer just wine, it's no longer just shopping, it's no longer just sex. It's a thing, a good thing often, that we use to become a thing that keeps us from feeling a feeling we don't want to feel. That's when you know something's become an addiction or an indulgence. It's become your source of peace and comfort and healing. It's become more than just a something. What's amazing is despite what Noah did, despite the consequences to his family, his grandkids and generations, God doesn't give up on him. God gives him a promise in Genesis chapter nine that's pretty powerful. He says to him, I see what you've done. This comes after this moment and I don't give up on you. Look what it says here in Genesis chapter nine. It says, God remembered his covenant and he gives this rainbow. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be the sign of the covenant. And a covenant is like a commitment. I'm still committed to you despite what you've done. It's between me and the earth as well. And it shall be that when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be the seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between you and me and every living creature. God makes a commitment that I see what you've done. You don't have to pretend. I saw you went to something to medicate the feelings you didn't want to feel but I'm still committed to you despite what you've done. Now, again, there's all kinds of crazy stories. Like I, as a pastor, I occasionally do weddings. And so I did a wedding one time and, and somebody got up to the microphone to do a, a toast to the whole family. And so they were up there, they had no notes. I kind of did this kind of woo, stories all over the place story. And they got done and like a lot of speeches, the person didn't know how to end. And so they got to the end, huge crowd of people, all very prim and proper for this, this wedding. And the person ends with, let's get drunk and let's get naked. And hands the microphone to me. I'm the next person up. I'm <laughs> looking out at the crowd who just heard him cry out, let's get drunk and naked. <laughs> I look at him. I look at the awkward look on everyone's faces and I say, uh, let's pray. And everyone <laughs> burst into laughter. Yeah, we could use some prayer right now. So again, we all have this tendency to judge other people when we might have something else we use to medicate. Food, spending, money, social media. And the truth is, especially this last year, there's been a lot of feelings of grief, of anxiety and worry that we've needed to medicate. We need a source to deal with that. In fact, I was talking to a friend who's been coming to Horizon for several years about how much he enjoys our online services and how much during COVID his family has been watching that together. And he's a doctor. He said, Chad, all day long, I am prescribing Xanax to conservatives and liberals. They're both coming into my, my office and they are anxious. They are overwhelmed. They don't know how to deal with the feelings they have. They've got different flavors of why they're anxious, but they're all asking for the same prescription. And people are weeping weeping in my office 
wanting to know there's some source of something they can hold on to when they feel anxious. See, when we don't have a promise from the God of the universe to hold on to, that God is for me, that even though the world seems chaotic, I know the God who's in control of all things. We have these feelings of chaos and worry and anxiety. And we find something to medicate those things. And what we're really longing for is a promise from God. So that's our second character. Let's look at the third. You see, God tells Noah and his descendants to go enjoy the new washed area. But they don't. They build a tower to themselves and God has to come down and confuse the languages. That causes the different nations and languages we have today. And one of those nations is a place called Ur. And here in Ur, we meet a man by the name of Abram. Now he'll eventually be known as Abraham, but Abraham... Uh, the father of our faith, the father of Christianity, Judaism, and the Muslim religion, you might think of him as an incredible example. Well, he is in some ways. He trusts God. He believes God. He's the first monotheist we know of in history. But what the Bible tells us is what we really find out about Abraham is that he lies. He lies about a lot of stuff. The father of our faith is A liar. Now that's shocking for many. The idea that the father of Christianity, of Judaism, of the Muslim faith is a liar? Well, yeah. Because the Bible's not about superheroes do everything right. It's about a God who works with people, gives promises to people who are off track. So here's what happens. The Lord appears to Abram. Says, get out of your country. Get away from your family. It's time for something new and from your father's house, who worshiped all kinds of other gods. I want you, I want to go to a land. Head to a land, I'm gonna show you. I wanna make you a great nation, and I'm gonna bless you. And I'm gonna make your name great, and you shall be a blessing to everyone. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's the Messiah, the descendant, which is Jesus. Everyone in the earth will be blessed with final forgiveness. So Abram departed just like the Lord spoken. Wow, he's obeying. Until you read the next verse. And Lot went with him. Don't take your family. He takes his nephew, which causes unbelievable division and heartache for years to come. So the first thing we discover is that Abram disobeyed God. But things get worse. He leaves Ur, He heads down the land of Canaan, and then he actually makes his way down to Egypt. And here's where his lying begins. It happens twice. He gets down, and the Pharaoh takes notice of his wife. Well, apparently, now he's in his like 90s at this point, but apparently he's got a good-looking wife. And apparently he's really insecure about how good-looking she is and what a schlump he is. So when the Pharaoh takes notice of his wife, he's like, we got to lie about this. We can trust God to leave her. We can trust God to be the God who's going to give us a blessing, but we can't trust him to save our neck from Pharaoh. So he turns to his wife and says, please, honey, tell him that you're my sister and it will be well with you for my sake that I may live because otherwise he's going to kill me to marry you because of you. Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you've done to me? You lied. You told me she was your sister. I started to kind of date her and turns out she's your wife. Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here's your wife. Go with her. Go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had touched. Like, well, okay, it's one time mistake. He ends up circling back to Egypt different pharaoh has the exact same experience. Abram lied. He lied out of insecurity. He lied because of fear. He lied. And I think the idea that God would work with a liar is hard for people to understand, but that's the main message of the Bible. Why is it hard to understand? Well, I think it's easier to live in a lie. She's my sister so I don't get killed than to live out a truth that's too good to be true. It's too good to be true that God could love me knowing all my insecurities, all my fears, and all my brokenness. It's too good to be true. 
I'd rather live in a lie than live out something that's too good to be true. Several years ago, we did a series at our church called CSI Religion. And in that, I invited my friend Maja Dabdu, who is a Muslim, to come and do an interview with me on stage. And we specifically talked about Abram. And he said, Chad, I, I gave you a copy of the Quran years ago. Did you read it? And I said, I did. And one of the things I noticed is that what the Quran says about Abraham and most of the prophets is the opposite of what the Bible says about most of the prophets. In the Quran, everybody does everything right. In the Bible, everybody does everything wrong. And I mentioned that Abram or Abraham was a liar and disobedient. He was shocked by this. I mean, just utterly shocked. He said, how could you follow a founder who does everything wrong? To which I said, we don't follow the founder. We follow the God who gave grace and forgiveness to that founder. And it was just so hard for him to accept. It's hard to live out a truth that's too good to be true. God could work with a founder who was a liar and disobedient, and he gets worse, by the way, in the Bible, and God still gives him a promise. God gives us a promise. When we are messed up, when we screw up, when we lie, when we're insecure, when we give in to our fears, God has a promise for you and I as well. That promise comes in Genesis chapter 15. It says, after these things, after he's lied, after he's disobeyed, after he's brought Lot with him, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Now keep in mind that phrase, the word of the Lord. That wasn't just God talking. That phrase, the word of the Lord, is actually a a manifestation of God. uh, What I'll tell you later is going to be Jesus in the Old Testament. It's a person. The word of the Lord speaks. The word of the Lord stands. The word of the Lord interacts. It's a second part of God that speaks to people and looks like a human being. Jesus will later reference the fact that he was the word of the Lord in the book of John. So Jesus, as God appears in the Old Testament to Abram and says, in a vision, do not be afraid. Abram, you spent so much of your life in fear and insecurity and not knowing who's in charge, not wondering, not knowing you could trust me. Do not be afraid. This is my promise. I am your shield and I am your exceedingly great reward. That's a powerful promise. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says, if you want to have faith in God, you have to believe he exists, but also believe that he rewards those who seek after him. God wants you to know he's your shield, that's the promise, and your exceedingly great reward. God says, I'm your shield. You don't need to lie to be your shield. You don't use self-defense mechanisms to be your shield. Let me be your shield. And your reward, I will reward you for trusting in me even when you go through valleys and dark times. Then the most important part of the Bible shows up here a few verses later. You see, when he left Egypt, one of the things that came with him was a woman named Hagar. And he had befriended her there and Pharaoh said, take everything you've touched. Well, Hagar becomes his maidservant. So again, we see him enslaving a woman that was common in those days. And he and his wife decide, since they're so old and can't get his wife pregnant, that he should impregnate his maidservant. Which again, that sounds horrible, right? Did she get a say in this? Well, that's what they did back then. Well, that's horrible. Well, they think, Abram does, God promised me a child and family. I don't have any children or family. We'll have a child through Hagar. But God says here in Genesis 15, this promise, part of my reward is, I will bring life out of your dead body. (laughs) Yeah, you're 99, you're 100, doesn't look like you have kids. I will bring life where there's only death. He says, this one, the child you had with Hagar, is not the heir I talked to you about, but look toward the heavens. See the stars if you can number them. I'm gonna make your descendants like the names and numbers of the stars. So it says that Abram believed God and it was accounted to him is righteousness. And this is the main message of the Bible. If you trust in God, despite what you've done, God will account, it's an accounting term, he will deposit into your spiritual inventory, you know, the righteousness of God. So he extracts everything you did wrong and he drops into your account everything God and Jesus did right. 
so you can trust God as your reward and your shield. You don't need to be defensive about what you've done wrong. You can say, yep, and God's forgiven it all, so I can own it. And I'm so thankful that I'm accepted based on God being my shield. The Bible's about belief in God's forgiveness to make us right. Not what we do for him, but what he did for us. Now let's look at this fourth character together. Abraham does have a son named Isaac, and Isaac becomes that child of promise, and he has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And let's talk specifically about that son, Jacob. Jacob, I like to think of as a professional wrestler, because what he's going to be known for is the fact that he wrestled with God. His name originally was Heel Catcher, which is kind of weird, and his name will be changed to Israel, one who wrestles with God. And he will have 12 sons. And those 12 sons, kind of the number on his jersey, are the 12 sons of Israel. So Jacob, the heel catcher, his name is now Israel, has 12 sons. And what we discover about him is that Jacob manipulates. He manipulates. His whole life, I can't trust God to come through on his promises. I've got to grab heels, grab opportunities, manipulate other people to get what I want. In fact, he was twins with his brother Esau and he came out holding onto the heel of his brother trying to get out first to be the firstborn. Well, later on in life, instead of trusting God to provide the promise that God would bring the blessing through his line, he decides to lie to his dad Isaac and pretend that he's his furry, burly brother Esau. So he puts on some fur onto his uh, skin. His dad's losing his eyesight. Is that you, Esau? Yes, yes, it's me, dad. And he manipulates his dad just like he's done most of his life. Well, Esau comes home, finds out he's lost the birthright to his brother, the manipulator, and says, Father, you gave away the birthright. And he cried an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he said to his father, bless me, bless me also, oh my father. But his dad Isaac said, your brother came with deceit. He manipulated me. He's taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? Which is what? The word Jacob in Hebrew means heel grabber. That's right, he's grabbing at heel, stealing things from other people. My brother's always been like this. Manipulating people, stealing from other people, taking what doesn't belong to him. Well, if your brother, who's an archer and a warrior, is out to kill you, you're on the run. And he goes on the run. For 14 years, he's on the run from his brother trying to kill him. He finally decides to try and reconcile with his brother. But he's not willing to do that until he wrestles with God. After feeling the manipulation from his uncle Laban, feeling what it's like to be manipulated, Jacob, or Israel, is starting to learn how it feels to be on the receiving end of deceit. So, one night he wrestles with God. And this is our fourth promise. He is wrestling with God in his vision. He, the angel of the Lord, another name for Jesus in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord, the manifestation of God in human form in the Old Testament, was wrestling with Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, heel grabber, but Israel, for you have struggled with God. Can I really trust you? Can I really be blessed by you? And with men, and you have prevailed. And that's our final promise. What does it mean to prevail in life? Prevailing means losing what you cannot keep. Manipulating, lying, you can't keep that stuff in order to gain what you can never lose, the favor of God. So when you hear the term Israel, the term literally means one who wrestles with God. God wants you and I to wrestle with him. So what's the takeaway for us? Well, I'd like you to think about picking one of those promises. What is the one promise that's most meaningful to you during this time? I wanna pick one of those to write on a wall, to put on a a post-it note on my mirror, And maybe it's that God covers you and you can be forgiven. Maybe it's that despite indulging, God hasn't given up on you. Maybe it's even though you've lied, God wants to be your shield when you face fear. He wants to be a reward. Or maybe God wants you to wrestle with your questions. 
wrestle with whether or not he can be trusted. God enjoys wrestling. Maybe that's a new idea for you. For the last couple of years, we've been trying to create tools to help you in your growth. I mean, the reason we're here to comfortably connect you to God through the Bible and a community of growing Christ followers is because we believe when you go through the Bible, God does something in you, in your family, in your life. So we'd like to make available to you during this time this booklet that we wrote called Fast Track. It's a chance to read through the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, in less than 90 minutes. Just 90 minutes. 90 minutes you will understand the Old and New Testament. There's, there's pictures like I've been drawing to go along with that these are companions to. And this will help you feel competent. And like, at least I know the basics. Now maybe you feel like, I don't know the basics. Well, 90 minutes, even if you don't believe in the Bible, What's 90 minutes to understand the the most popular piece of historic literature? So this is available to you. You could call the office and get a hard copy or go to the website and download a PDF. But I would encourage you during this series to read through the booklet so you can understand the main message of the Bible. But then today, pick one promise that God might want to use in your life and your family to give you hope during these challenges as well. Let me pray for you. And let's look at what God may have for us as we look to the future ahead of us. What does it look like for us to say, God, I want to trust you to face the future together. Father, as we hear this next song, God, we just want to lean into you and lean into your promises as the source of hope and strength and wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Side. Across the sea into my soul Reaches into where I cannot hide Setting my feet across the road My heart is old and holds my memory It's where I find myself again Carrying lays it down the road that I must travel Carrying lays it through the darkness of the night Carrying lays it where I'm going, will you follow? of the night.